Hi, Lynx community. It's Michael Zinzer, Chair of the Faculty Assembly, and I'm here with Michelle Larson Krieg, Chair of Staff Council. And also here today are Chancellor Harrell, Provost Nairn, and Jennifer Sobene, CU Denver's Chief Financial Officer. And we're here to have a conversation with questions from you that have been submitted before about our financial situation. But first, Chancellor Harrell, I'd like to say a few words. Thanks so much, Michael, and uh, hello to all of you. I know it's hard not being together in person, but I'm pleased we have this opportunity uh, through technology to connect with each other. And before uh, we get into the meat of today's conversation, I really want to, on behalf of the entire administrative team of CU Denver, extend our heartfelt gratitude for the remarkable response that all of you have had to the challenges that uh, we've been facing with this pandemic. Every day we hear stories of how you are going above and beyond to support our students, to support each other, and to support the broader community. And it's incredibly heartening, but really far from surprising for anybody who knows this community. I hope you've all been able to keep up with some of the incredible good news about ways people have been responding in our CU Denver news and on social media. It's really quite awesome. And we know that we asked all of you to pivot and uh, do something extraordinary in working and teaching from home. And you've responded with creativity, with resilience and resolve. And I wanna give a special shout out to our staff members in facilities and IT and others who are providing us essential services. And they're still coming to campus every day to make sure that the rest of us can do our jobs remotely. I also want to acknowledge the circumstances that have upended everyone's lives. And many of you are being called on to be your children's teachers, to be caretakers for uh, elderly parents, relatives, and neighbors. And for those of you who have family members on the front lines providing health care and other essential services in our community, thank you. All of you have our admiration, respect, and gratitude. And members of our community have lost loved ones during this time, and our hearts really go out to you. The hardship of not being able to be at their sides is impossible to comprehend, but know that we extend our deepest sympathy and that we'll keep you in our thoughts. And today, um, as Michael mentioned, this um, is an opportunity for us to talk about the economic impact that, um, that this pandemic has had on CU Denver. We all know that it's in addition to being a health crisis, it's an economic um, impact that is being felt by individuals, families, businesses, and communities worldwide. And higher ed is not exempt from that. And as Michael mentioned, you've received a communication that outlined kind of the broad picture, and we want to be able to respond to your questions today. While there are still many factors that um, can't be immediately known, such as the state budget and summer and fall enrollment, we do know that the CU system, CU Denver, and every other Colorado higher ed institution will be dealing with declining revenue. And for our campus, that's something that uh, we've been dealing with this year because our fall enrollment, as many of you know, did not meet what the budget projections were. So we've already been dealing with um, a reduced budget scenario. And we're fortunate over the last couple of years to have, been, uh, to have put in place an incentive-based budget model and the Chancellor's Advisory Committee on, on Budget. And in addition to the deans and cabinet members, we've had active participation from our governance leaders, from faculty, staff, and students. And at this point, I'd, I'd particularly like to thank, thank Michael and Michelle for your regular involvement. And we've seen a, a lot of each other on Zoom here uh, recently. And we, I want you to know that we do have a lot of tools and processes in place that will help us as we move forward in making decisions as the information becomes clearer. And I'm gonna ask Jennifer in just a moment to talk more about the scenario planning that is already underway. And I want all of you to know that our goal will be to keep CU Denver 
as whole as we possibly can. We know that the education, the research, the scholarly and creative activities that we provide will be more important than ever when we get to the other side of this and as our state begins its economic recovery. We know that our students, as they have been for decades, will be the thought leaders and decision makers going forward. And the knowledge and skills that all of us are responsible for giving them, their innovative problem solving and decision making will be essential to our university, our community, our state, and in fact, the world. So with that, um, let me pass it over to Jennifer and ask that she talk a little bit more specifically about some of the early work and the scenarios that we're looking at. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, and I, I really appreciate um, being given this opportunity to explain what we're doing. Um, certainly, when we, when we have this kind of uncertainty, and let's be honest, we are in unprecedented times. We don't know what the future is going to look like for our budget situation, but we know that this is having enormous impact in the current year, as you all saw in the um, communique that we sent out, we're experiencing about, it's about $5 million of an impact in the current budget year. And the new budget year starts July 1. And for us, because we have such uncertainty with what that will look like, the best thing we can do is start to plan for it and shape that future as much as we possibly can. And as Dorothy said, our goal is that we can thrive after we get through this, that we need to set ourselves up for success during this time so that we can serve our community and serve our students. And it's, while it's hard to do this with this uncertainty, what we've started to do is scenario planning. And that's where we can, without knowing the details of what our revenue is going to look like, we're beginning to do scenario plans around a 10% uh, shortfall in revenue at the general fund, as well as a 20% shortfall in general in general fund revenue and those plans by scenario planning it allows us to begin to look at the ways that we can maximize our one-time increases and hopefully minimize our ongoing reductions and that gives us the time and the space for all of the leaders around the campus to be able to plan so that when we do begin to know the details whether that's our state support, whether that's our enrollment or what the mix of students coming back are in the, in the fall or other revenue streams. As we begin to know those things, we can put those pieces of the puzzle in place and begin to react. But in the meantime, by doing scenario planning, we're able to, to, to prepare ourselves um, for what is, we know is coming. We just don't know the details of what is coming. And so we're using our incentive-based budget model processes to do that. And certainly Michael and Michelle, I can answer any questions that you have about those processes as we go along. But I just wanted to explain the scenarios that we're looking at and they are certainly significant revenue shortfalls. Dr. Nair, did you add, want to add to that? Yeah, thanks Jennifer. <clears throat> thanks everybody for the opportunity to join you for this conversation. Look forward to the questions. Uh, and thanks for everything that you're doing in these difficult times. I mean, obviously the pandemic has created a unique set of opportunities for all of us at a level that we haven't, you know, experienced before. But you know, those of us who have been our NCU Denver for a while, and some of you have been here longer than I have, um, you know that we've dealt with major issues before. And our history is that we figured it out in the past, and I'm confident we'll figure it out again. I mean, let's think about the the recession in 07, uh, we worked our way through that. We've even had, you know, it wasn't a pandemic, but it was an epidemic of SARS that did a huge amount of damage to our international programs years ago. We came out of that uh, stronger in the end. And, you know, I think uh, past history is always a great predictor of the future. Um, and our history is that we'll come out of this one stronger too. We'll figure it out. We're already uh, working on scenarios to start bringing the campus, you know, back to life again with a safe return. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later in this session, I think. And we're making plans for what will likely be future growth, you know, in a year or so. But a lot of hard work to be done in the meantime. And look forward to trying to explain that to you as we try to answer the questions that you've posed. 
I'll uh, turn it back to Michael. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Dr. Nair. Well, you've all seen the communication that came out last week about the potential budgetary impacts we're facing due to the COVID-19 epidemic. In response, as we've just heard, the administration is beginning scenario planning to look at how we might weather the storm. Some immediate moves that have been taken include a hiring chill in which we're hiring only for mission critical positions, a pause in merit increases, and a pause in travel. But it's likely that more changes are to come to ensure our financial stability going forward. We know this is a cause for great concern for all of us, and we're here today with our leadership to have them address the questions you've submitted. And then some following. Michelle? Thank you. So Michael and I are gonna take turns asking questions of our guests. These are the questions or are based on the questions that you submitted in advance. In addition, you can submit questions live during the Zoom via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will get to as many of your questions as we can. What we can't get to today, we'll save for future conversations, as we know that this is just the beginning of this dialogue. So let's begin. Okay, thank you, Michelle. First question, what specific steps is leadership taking to give faculty governance voice in decisions about budget cuts affecting their employment status, things like furloughs, layoffs, professional responsibilities, things like teaching loads, research, and benefits. How will we know our voice is genuinely considered? Okay, I'm gonna take that one, Michael. Um, so I think, you know, what I think everybody needs to hear and hopefully understands is we'll do everything we can to protect people as much as we possibly can. Part of that is the this you know tradition of shared governance, and we live in a shared governance environment. I think you know the, that uh, we have always in leadership at uh, CU Denver uh, reached out to the shared governance groups, whether it's faculty or staff or students. We we recognize that you've got you know smart folks and good ideas. We do not have all the answers. We look to you to be part of a you know a, a joint process of coming to decisions. We look for you for recommendations. Obviously, you know, at the end of the day, there's a leadership group that has to make the decision that we want to hear from you and get your input. And, and so, as you know, there's a variety of places in which that happens. I mean, it's at the board level, there's input from all of the governance groups. At the system level, there's, you know, faculty council, there's staff council, there's uh, student group, uh, ICA group that gives, you know, input. The campus level, there's this, you know, the equivalent groups, whether it's faculty assembly or staff council, we meet with all of you regularly to get your input. So there's always been about a monthly meeting, including, you know, a, a separate meeting just with the, uh, the, the executive, what was now the executive budget group, uh, uh, the chancellor, the CFO, and the problems. And then, you know, I think really importantly for some of these things, when you get to the the details, I mean, there's school and college and department level processes that take place. All of that, you know, are mechanisms and devices to get, you know, input, to help us make the right, deci the right decision. Um, how will you know that your voice is considered? Well, I think you're all participating in that. I mean, it's part of a dialogue and a debate. Um, and then you'll see the outcomes. Um, you'll see that things change as we go along. We listen to you. Others, Jennifer, Dorothy, add it, when I need to add anything to that? I think I would just add that the Chancellor's Advisory Committee on Budget, which we've had now in our planning and budgeting process for over three years, always includes our governance leaders, all of, um, well, the two of you, um, as well as our student government leaders, um, and our Budget Priorities Committee Chair, um, Diana White. And so um, there's a lot of uh, uh, opportunity for input across the planning and budgeting process, um, as well as with what Rod was talking about in the ways in which each of you can provide that through either your school or college or the business unit that you belong to. Thank you. And there's a follow-up uh, question about this. A common approach to enlisting governance is to invite faculty governance leaders to attend meetings where policy is being developed under the requirement that what's discussed remain private until the final hours. We much appreciate this opportunity, but hope for a way to more fully 
and frequently engage our governance bodies as discussions evolve. Will you work with us on that? Yeah, of course we will. Sometimes we're limited by, you know, short time turnarounds. I mean, I think, you know, Michael, it's been the, the, uh, unfortunately a tradition, especially when it comes to budget, that we, we frequently have hours and not days or weeks. Um, and one of the downsides of a, a participatory democracy is it takes a lot of time. So we've tried to do the best we can by reaching out to the executive committees and saying, look, we, we need to get your input. We can't, we, there isn't time to get the entire campus involved in listening to this, hearing this, giving us input, and this is the best we can do. So let's try to make the most of it. Thank you. I have never known a more important time for governance than this. Uh, Michelle. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and the question that I had was largely addressed, um, but I'm, I'm wondering if any of you could speak to maybe how precisely staff input would be considered as decisions are, are being made um, regarding operational budget cuts and employment related issues. You've spoken already to many of the ways that that will, will occur, um, but how can we be sure that those, those voices are considered? And you know, I think that we're especially concerned with how financial decisions will impact student services. I can start that if you like. I mean, I'm the, I mean, most of the, uh, you know, whether it's <clears throat> senior budget folks or uh, folks in the units or staff. I mean, we work very closely with them. They, they are partners in all of this and giving us input. I mean, think about it in my own case with Lisa Tensio. There's not, there's it's a rare, it's a very rare day that I don't talk to her and get her input into what we need to do with an ASNA. I think that's true across the spectrum, whether it's deans in the schools and colleges or people in the units. I mean, staff have a valuable role to play. Um, Jennifer, I think, convenes the senior business administrators regularly to get their level, uh, their input and advice. I mean, they have a big part in the decision making. And I, I would just piggyback on to what Dr. Nairn said in that we do, I meet with staff all of the time, but I think that, Michelle, if there's anything that you think that we should be doing in addition to what we're already doing with the structures that we have in place, let us know that. If that's surveys that you want us to send out, if it's ways to collect information that staff council can help us with, let us know. Um, certainly both you, Michael, and Michelle, in our, you know, we meet at least twice a week. Um, for a while, it was every day uh, during the operational uh, transition that we had to make. But if we need to be meeting more often, or if there are ways, Michelle, that you can help us bring the staff voice in, if, if we're not feeling that it's there enough, let us know that. These are important times for all of us to be connecting. And the cascading of information from the conversations that we have with you, the cascading information needs to go out to everybody, but then back to us. And if there are mechanisms that you want to put into place that would help with that, please, let's do it. We, we need to hear from everybody. Thank you. I'll just add real quickly that, um, you know, as we have met with the deans and certainly the vice chancellors and unit heads, that the expectation that they all have is that, we need to have input from lots of different people that uh, the details are, are best understood at the level where those tasks are being carried out. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that there's going to be, um, you know, we've heard it and it's already begun in some areas, outreach uh, to individuals and to say, we've got to wrestle with this, uh, help us do that. What ideas do you have? Uh, what areas are there for perhaps efficiencies or more collaboration across the campus? So um, I, I think you know, our expectation and Rod and Jennifer and I have communicated this pretty directly to uh, the deans and vice chancellors that, um, you know, that that's going to be the way that we're going to get through this um, and really uh, do so in the most responsible way possible. Thank you. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, next question. How will you prioritize cuts across the faculty ranks and employment classes like tenure track, non tenure track, instructional research, clinical, lecturer? 
Who is at most risk of layoffs and furloughs here at CU Denver? And then I have a follow-up question. Can I get a second to start this one off? So I think uh, the piece that I would reiterate is something that I said already, that we've made a commitment across the university that we're going to do everything we possibly can to protect people as much as we can in this process. So that to us means that we try every way that we possibly can to avoid layoffs, which is the way I interpret cuts. So let's layoffs are, are hopefully the last resort. Um, in order to do that, we've got to, if we, you know, and we, as has been said before, we don't know the extent of the budget cuts that we're gonna to have to deal with. And once we have a better idea, maybe towards the, the end of May after the May 19th board meeting and the, and the state budget decisions on May 15th, we'll have a better idea. But what I would say uh, is that all of us are at risk of furloughs is the way we would probably tackle this, which, you know, represents, you know, uh, salary cuts. Um, we'll try to work our way through that as equally as we can to try to protect people from being laid off. Um, it works across faculty and staff, and it affects student workers too. So everybody's in there. And when it comes to where are the, if you, none of this is easy, but we, you know, where are the places that you, that you're going to look to uh, where it is easier, you know, it's going to be in those areas that are at will. I mean, it's a, it is a very difficult to do things again with tenured folks. I mean, there's contractual and legal agreements there. That, uh, but this is something that we hope is, is going to impact us drastically for a year and then start to loosen up and hopefully get better. So my, the likelihood is those folks, you know, in those areas that are more at will. Um, the auxiliary is something that uh, I think Jennifer can speak to more. If your auxiliary things are, are areas where, you know, you're providing a service and you generate a media revenue. And if you can't provide the service, you don't generate the revenue. So those are places that, just like at will, are going to be more at risk. But again, I want to reiterate, we've made a commitment for a very long time to the people on this campus. And that's what's most important. We're going to try to protect that to the best that we can. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody in this process is going to go through some difficult times and we're going to all get hurt to some extent. We can't promise it's going to be minimized and some, but people are going to get hurt. We'll do everything we can to protect folks. Thank you. This afternoon, we're in the people business. What we do is interact with and help our students and our community. And so we can't do that without our faculty, staff, and our student workers um, who perform such important roles across our campus. And um, Dr. Nairn brought up the auxiliaries. That's certainly something that's on our minds, but I want to just be clear that when we talk about our auxiliaries, we talk about a couple of different things. It's the extended studies and professional um, education that we provide. That's an auxiliary, and that is incredibly important that we continue all of that teaching and learning that goes on in, in those auxiliaries. We also have auxiliaries that are like our uh, the Lola and Rob Salazar Wellness Center, Student Wellness Center, Links Crossing, as well as parking is an auxiliary. And I'll give you an example with, uh, with parking. Um, that's money that we collect from different people who park in our parking lots, as well as use them for ballet services downtown. And as we've lost revenue in those areas, what we use that revenue for has always been either um, some of our operations, but mainly debt service to the Lawrence Street Center. And so if you think about losing that revenue, how do we then find ways to cover our debt service? And we can eliminate some of the operational expenses, but you can't eliminate debt service. And so those are things that we're wrestling with and working with um, the system office with, our, um, with the system treasurer on how can we manage through times where we're seeing declines in revenue, but the expenses stay the same. Those are things that we have to work through. But I, I would just echo what, what Dr. Nairn is saying is, looking at opportunities to manage this on a one-time basis, whether that's furloughs, temporary pay cuts, um, operational changes, that we can um, delay um, costs. That's the best way for us to, to look at this in the scenarios where, when things aren't as severe, where we can limit as many layoffs as possible. Because 
we want to come out on the end of this and, and thrive. And we have to, we do that through our people because that's our business. So Jennifer did a, a good job of explaining the, the scenarios that are currently being worked through on campus. And I think that we all understand that uh, more information is needed before final decisions can be made regarding the, the fiscal year 21 budget. Um, but who is, can you explain who is currently involved in the scenario planning? Um, and how will budget actions be proposed and approved? And would it be possible uh, for us to work out a, and share a communication plan so that we can see more clearly who is making these decisions as well as who will be impacted? Sure. Um, so just to give a little bit of process information, um, the people who are involved in the scenario planning right now are the deans of our schools and colleges as well as the cabinet and the cabinet are the people who oversee the central support units who support the schools and colleges whether that's on the academic and student affairs side or the central services administration university communications um, office of digital education things like that and so those are the people who are involved right now in understanding and really wrestling through the different scenarios and um, we're, they're being supported by the budget office as well as OIRE and, the, and legal counsel as they begin to think about and understand the different um, strategies. I, I call it a toolkit. It's a budgeter's toolkit of the ways in which um, we can um, make budget reductions. And we categorize those as one-time reductions and ongoing reductions. And so as, as, um, as we, develop those different scenario options, we will definitely want to share those out. And we will, we are putting together a communications plan. A piece of this is it's been happening so quickly and things have been changing so much that as we've moved into the scenario planning process, as we get more information, more real information that helps us kind of lock down which scenario we think we'll be in, that's when we can really start to share a lot more information because then it's not creating confusion, um, but instead it's creating um, clarity around what are the options and what are we facing. And so we will definitely be communicating more about that. But like Dr. Miriam said, a big, big piece of information is coming in mid-May as we learn uh, from the Joint Budget Committee and the governor what they're going to be doing with the state budget. We'll learn more when the Board of Regents makes decisions on May 19th in their board meeting around compensation, tuition and fees, and decisions like that. And of course, we'll know even more as we understand our enrollment situation for fall. And so we will, as we hit all of those hurdles and get over them and get that information, we'll be able to share even more information. Thank you. Okay, next question. The financial communique shared with the CU Denver community notes the following. A temporary moratorium is now in effect on pay increases, promotions, and employee transfers until further notice. Does this mean that all faculty, both tenure track and non-tenure track, promotions, that is the promotions of those two classes, are suspended or that promotions will continue as usual, but related pay increases will be suspended? Okay, let, me, let me try to answer that one. Um, so the, the, the uh, reappointment tenure and promotion process, as I think most faculty know, is something that's, that is mandated within region law and policy. So people have to move through a particular cycle of comp review of four years and tenure within seven and so on. Um, so that process um, is you know, separate from any normal, shall we say, you know, uh, employee promotion process, it's different. So that is moving through in the usual way, albeit slower than usual. Um, we got a few other things to do, but it is moving through the process of, you know, review within the schools and colleges, reviewing the campus with the Vice Chancellor's Advisory Committee, 
uh, moving to, to my office and the chancellor and the president and the board. Um, it's still my intent for the Denver campus that we will get that uh, tenure process done for the June board meeting. That's still a goal. Um, as far as promotion goes, um, without tenure, promotion happens on the campus and we have authority to deal with those things like somebody moving from associate to full professor. We can handle on the campus. It doesn't have to be completed uh, by the June board meeting because there's no role for the board in that. So it may get a little bit delayed just because of all the other things that we're doing related to the pandemic. Um, as far as the, as the IRC faculty are concerned, um, or what we used to call non-tenure track faculty. Um, we will look at mission critical things, um, but also there's no regent mandated law and policy process there for folks. Um, those are uh, separate, you know, processes that that uh, with different, you know, rules and regulations and criteria within the schools and colleges. But at this point, you know, we're able to look at those on a mission critical basis. So those decisions can get made um, by the chancellor and the CFO and myself, and we'll look at them. As far as the, you know, the the related pay increase concern, there's always been on the general academic campuses. A, it's a small amount of money that is in the budget every year for those promotion related, you know, tenure track faculty promotion related things. That's still in the budget. Um, it's an intent of this process to try to honor that, um, but uh, more to come on that. You know, the, the, uh, but that's the intent at this point. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, how will we know if we, as individual employees, are being considered for pay reductions, furloughs, workload adjustments, or layoffs? Will there be some system in place for the delivery of these critical messages? Um, I'll take this one and certainly um, those others can chime in as needed. Um, I think we should all be preparing for some level of furlough, temporary pay reduction, um, workload adjustments. I think that if we all um, want to avoid layoffs as much as possible. We all need to be ready to take on some of those expense reductions that we have to take to be able to, map, to, to have our, our expenses meet our revenues. And it, it's one of those times where we're all, we're all gonna be in this together. I think how we figure out those details, we'll be working with the Chancellor's Advisory Committee on budget on that. And um, certainly, really relying on the um, information that that um, we can get from our deans and from our cabinet, as well as the information that our governance leaders can bring in. But I think we should all be prepared for that, um, because I think we all believe in wanting to make sure that uh, we have as few layoffs as possible. Um, as for timing and how we would provide that information. Certainly, we need to get through the May board meeting so we can understand all that we have, um, th that we can have at that moment in time, um, because we have to turn in a budget at, at the June board meeting and um, so that we can begin the July 1 fiscal year. So I believe that a lot of information will be able to flow right after we come through the May board meeting and have more certainty and more information around the, the data points in our budget. And then we'll be able to get that information out as quickly as, as, as we can. I might just add one contextual comment here. Um, and the reason why both the provost and our CFO are both saying that we are trying to, going to try to the very best of our abilities to cover uh, the reductions with one-time cuts. Um, it depends on how deep those have to be if we have to uh, do more than that. But that's because, and I've heard Rod say this since the first day I arrived, CU Denver is very lean. When you look at us uh, in comparison to peer institutions um, across the country, there isn't. <laughs> 
fat that exists in this institution. And, um, you know, we, we tell that story um, when needed with the right folks um, because of the fact that it is not uh, that we've got a lot of places where we can just say, you know, we can do, do without that. And so that's why Jennifer and Rod are both, I think, saying that this is going to be shared by all of us because we are all needed going forward. And so the extent to which we can keep things intact so that we can be able to rebuild when the time comes, that will really be our, our intent and our commitment. Thank you. And I do, I do have a follow up. You know, we've talked a lot about potential c cuts. Um, what what kind of thinking is has been started, perhaps on the on the revenue side of the picture? Thank you. Uh, if you want, you want to start with it, and I'll, I'll pick it back on top. Well, we've certainly started to think about scenario planning for how we bring people back to restart the campus. You know, and I think that is about. How do we start capturing revenue? Um, you know, as one of the things that I think we need to think about quite a bit, and I've started to talk uh, with the folks in CLES, is if you think about the situation that we're in in the pandemic, it exposes the lack of infrastructure and public health in this country. Um, we happen to have, you know, a remarkably good and very popular uh, undergraduate program in public health. It connects to you know one of the best schools of public health in the country. Um, there ought to be an opportunity there, and I, I've already heard that we're hearing inquiries from students about how could they get involved in public health. Uh, the the rumor is there could be hundreds of thousands of new jobs in public health as a result of this pandemic. Um, that might be a revenue opportunity for us, especially if we can move quickly, come up with something that's uh, you know you know, online or whether it's fully online or partially online uh, program in public health. That may be something that, that uh, the provost is banging on the table saying we need to invest in. And Jennifer needs to free up some of her pots of gold from our office. He actually pulled me out of another meeting yesterday to talk exactly about this topic of, of, around a, a program in public health. Um, I would just add to that enrollment is key for us. 80% of our revenue is coming from enrollment and that's both recruitment and retention of students. And so the ways in which we can all come together to help improve our enrollment prospects and we know that we have some weak place, weak spots right now just because of federal issues and international issues. And so we might have to think about tweaking our mix of enrollment. And um, we have, I, I just literally came from a meeting before this, this interview time um, with the Strategic Enrollment Management uh, Plan co-sponsors and we're meeting with the steering committee tomorrow. We put a little bit of that work on hold as we went through our operational changes to moving to um, working and, and learning from home, but we're going to, Go, get right back into that work of how can we create a strategic enrollment management plan for both undergrad and grad for this institution that can capitalize on the great programs that we have as well as what the market is demanding to Dr. Nairn's point. And that work we began in earnest back in the fall had to put it on ice for a little while uh, as we made this transition and we'll be starting that steering committee is actually meeting tomorrow. And so the work that we can do in all of us owning how we can retain our students is critical and will really be one of the important data points that we can add into how much budget reducing we actually have to do next year. So thank you, Michelle, for that question. Thank you for answering it. Okay, next question. Now, this uncomfortable question calls for a bit of an introduction. And it's an amalgamation of several similar questions that were submitted that bear on salary reductions amongst administrators. And to my mind, it illustrates the fact we in the university community are indeed all in this together. That statement's true and it's often said but we're not all in it in the same way, to the same degree, with the same at stake. So that said, here's the question. Forbes reports that voluntary salary reductions are occurring in the range of 10 to 20% for upper level university administrators, that that's common. 
although some have been as high as 30%. President Kenneth, Mark Kennedy announced that he, along with the four campus chancellors and seven executive staff members, will take a 10% pay cut through furloughs, saving almost $400,000. Members of the CU Denver community have expressed surprise that CU administrators are not volunteering for more than the 10% salary reduction. Given the income disparities across CU, including and especially CU Denver's hardworking staff, is a reduction of this size fair? And will those in the vice chancellor positions and above be taking a 10% furlough in line with Kennedy and his team? Let me um, take the first go at that, Michael. And I do think that's a very fair question um, and something that um, is going to get a whole lot more attention. You know, there are decisions that are made at the system. We are a voice at that table, uh, not always the prevailing voice, uh, I might add. But uh, I would say that that decision is the first layer. There is so much more information to come. And when it comes to the decisions that are made on the campus, as we've said, we'll know a whole lot more in mid-May. What I would say to you would be that um, those at the highest levels of, of uh, the institution will have the highest cuts. We're looking already at a tiered approach uh, for that. And, uh, reductions in pay is an important tool, but not the only tool. Um, and so, you know, what what I'd say is that you know that that information has be is um, has already been made public at this point, but there will be more um, more to come. I can only speak for CU Denver during the time that I'm there or uh, here, but um, you know that I I know that as we've talked about it, that that will be one of the tools that we're going to have to deploy. Okay, and word may come from as soon as mid-May. That's not that far away. Um, anyone else want to add to that? Okay. Uh, okay, yeah. Thank, thank you. Um, and the, the next question, and I think this will probably be our last question, um, I'm, I'm going to take from those that came in, um, and it is this. How are mission critical hires determined and by whom? And where does the VC of diversity and inclusion fall within the list of mission critical hires? Well, let me take a stab at that one, if that's okay. I'm sure my colleagues will join in. Um, so in general terms, mission critical hires start in the units. So let's say it's a faculty member that somebody really feels that they have to have, and it may be a replacement, it may be new, but they start in the, in the units. They work their way through the approval processes and search processes that are appropriate for the circumstance. But at the end of the day, um, uh, they now finish up with the executive budget committee. So it's Dorothy, Jennifer, and myself to make a final decision. We, if it's faculty or coming out of the schools and colleges as a, a staff position, whatever it might be, those would come with a recommendation from the dean, or if it's central services units, they come from the leadership of those units, you know, and, and uh, we ask for that explanation, then the three of us have to make a final decision about whether it's justified within the budget and is really mission critical or not. So that would include leadership positions, um, like the vice chancellor for diversity and inclusion, like the dean of the business school, like the uh, senior Vice Chancellor for Student Success, those are all things that are viewed mission critical, they're all moving forward at different levels, um, and uh, uh, we've made those decisions that they're to go forward. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, Michael, there's one more question for you. Yeah, all right, and I'll take that one. And these are, these last questions for all attending are ones that have come in uh, that we're processing on the fly. And this is an interesting one. Uh, can faculty be provided with the option to take a pay reduction or teach another course or take a bigger service load? I'll take a stab at that. Um, you know, that's an interesting question. It raises a number of issues for faculty in different tracks, you know, tenure versus uh, tenure track versus the IRC faculty. 
that's something that you know I think we will take under consideration. It may be an option for for you know an an enhanced uh, teaching load, extra course or courses um, versus a pay reduction. We'd have to take a look at that. There's some contractual and legal issues depending on what kind of faculty it is. Um, we've started to talk about that. Um, something we need to actively consider. I would say a bigger service load, um, less likely, but it depends what it is. I mean, it may be a, a, a leadership load that might typically come with, uh, you know, course reductions or some other kind of compensation that may, be, that may not be provided uh, in this circumstance. All of these, I think, would be case by case um, as we try to look and see what would be best for the university at the end of the day. It's a good question. It's a, it's a complicated answer, my favorite word. <laughs> it's, it's a complex question because I think we would, in addition to all of the things that Dr. Nair mentioned, is each dean would need to work with their leadership teams and their um, chairs and individual faculty on what that means specifically in their school and college. So I think when we think about what decisions can be made globally versus locally, that is a, we'd have to obviously work through what, what, what Rod was talking about with the legal side and all of the implications, but I think that we would have to uh, really have that sort of decision being made at, at the school and college level, depending on what the needs are of the operations at that point in time. That's a complex question. Well, thank you all so much. And, and specifically, thank you to Chancellor Harrell, to Provost Nairn, and, and to Jennifer Sobonet for joining us today. And thank you, too, for your very thoughtful and frank answers. Um, we know that this is a difficult time for all of us, and we really appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation. Um, for, for everyone listening in, um, and for any of you who have colleagues who may have not been able to join today, please note that this session was recorded and should be available uh, by the end of the day tomorrow. Okay. Um, this is the beginning of the conversation as we know more challenging times and tough decisions are ahead. Watch your email about future Zoom conversations such as this one in the near future. And if your question wasn't answered today or posed today, please contact me or Michelle and we can begin collecting questions now for our next interview. And um, I'd like to thank you all for being with us and invite the panelists, if they wish, to say what they want about safe return. I might just um, add just a couple of things. Rod began talking about that a bit. And uh, just this week, we are putting in place a safe return planning team uh, because while we don't know what it's going to look like or exactly when it will happen, we do anticipate that we will begin a very thoughtful process uh, to being look, to looking at that. And as a part of that planning team, it will have a, a focus on research, scholarly, and creative activity on the teaching and learning mission and also on our housing and wellness center. And so there will be an opportunity there for a great deal of involvement for folks in, from different aspects of the university as we uh, think through um, learning from work that's been done at institutes and other universities across the country to really make um, good decisions. And of course, we'll need to collaborate with um, our colleagues on the Auraria campus as well because of the shared buildings that we have. So that is underway and we're hoping, uh, we're, they're on a tight time frame to try and get recommendations back to us by mid-May. So again, at the May 19th board meeting that we can have some preliminary ideas of how we'll move forward. Thanks to both of you and um, enjoyed this opportunity and look forward to the next one. Yes, thank you. And Jennifer? I just want to chime in on the safe return because I think, Michelle, when you think about the role of staff and how important our consolidated staff members are between Denver and Anschutz in bringing the safe return alive to uh, the, the, the Denver campus, it's so impactful, the work that 
our consolidated employees are doing to really help with um, a safe return at the Anschutz campus, take what they're learning at the Anschutz campus and the work there, bringing it here to CU Denver, but also, as Dorothy said, to the Auraria campus. And even MSU Denver and CCD, Dorothy and I were on a call with them today, talking to them about how we can use what we're learning through our consolidated entity of Denver Anschutz and how we can apply that to help bring the Auraria campus to a safe return also. So it's just another acknowledgement of the incredible staff that we have, as well as Michael, the faculty who are helping us with all of this, to, of what we can do together to really bring that safe return um, to our campus as quickly as the public health officials allow us to do that. So just an acknowledgement of, of all of the resources that we have across Denver and Anschutz and how really blessed we are. And, and thank you both for hosting this time together and I look forward to uh, more conversations as we go through uh, the, this journey together. Thanks everyone.